Conflict, Delegation, and a Healthy Work Environment by Aaron Abraham for Leadership and Management via Dr. Dyer Kramer. So in this scenario, a uh, pediatric patient is having an adenoidectomy done. The doctor completes the procedure at uh, 10 minutes to 6 p.m. How so the patient is not awake and drinking by the 6 p.m. cutoff in order to be discharged. So any patient who is not awake and drinking by 6 p.m. typically gets admitted to the floor, but the doctor now sees a patient awake and drinking by 6.15 and demands that they get discharged because it's not a big deal for them to be awake and drinking 15 minutes later and this way the patient's family stays satisfied by getting discharged as previously agreed. However, the nursing staff wants to make sure that they go home because their department closes at 7 p.m. and the patient is not, has not arrived to them by 6. So now we have a conflict. So the first part of resolving a conflict is a confrontation. Uh, sometimes a conflict can work themselves out, uh, especially between a nurse and a doctor. They may be able to come to their own agreement. If they do not, we may consult a third party. This is typically going to be the management that is on the floor. Um, behavior change is also an aspect of resolving conflict. This may, if there is a constant problem with uh, doctors constantly trying to go past the six o'clock deadline and still discharge their patients, there may be some behavior changes that need to be made. So responsibility charting. So this goes onto the responsibilities of the nurse and the doctor. So the doctor may consider he has a responsibility to keep his word to the families and the patient that if he tells them they will be discharged and this will be done as an outpatient procedure, that this will be so. The nurse also has a responsibility, uh, well the management has a responsibility of making sure that their staff does not go into overtime. If they foresee that this may keep staff members past the 7 o'clock deadline, that they may want to consider enforcing that 6 o'clock rule. Uh, structure change. This can be examining um, the you know certain details that may be able to have a gray areas or if anyone is willing to bend. For instance, if the nurse uh, that is concerned about getting out on time, if they are short on their hours and don't mind staying back a little bit later, that may be a factor to consider. Another factor to, con to consider is that they have told you that they don't have anything important to do that day. They're not in school, no kids. They may have no issue staying a little bit longer or risking staying a little bit longer in order to discharge a patient. Uh, so soothing one party. This type of situation is definitely going to have quote unquote a winner or a loser. The patient is either going to be discharged or they're going to be admitted. That could result in either the doctor being unhappy or the nursing staff being unhappy. Uh, either way that it works out, someone is going to need some soothing in some type of way. So as far as uh, when a third party or management may step into this type of negotiating situation, they want to gather as much information as possible so they have all the negotiating power and leverage that they have. Um, this may, this definitely in this situation would include first and foremost the condition of the patient. One, are they recovering from anesthesia efficiently? Are they all their vitals stable? Are they, is their pain under control? Uh, are they meeting all of the aspects that they would need in order to be discharged? If there's anything at all that, that looks like the patient is not, they should be admitted because they're already past the discharge time. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, there's also the staff to consider. If the staff, nursing staff, has already told you that they have important prior engagements before this situation even came to be, or before this conflict even came to be, that should be taken into consideration, knowing that the, in order to keep your staff happy. Um, the doctor should also be taken into consideration too. They do have a rep to uh, uphold and this type of thing definitely is what's going to affect things like press gainy scores and customer satisfaction. Uh, so when you're neg negotiating doing this type of thing, it's important to speak calmly, to listen to everyone, to not be condescending in any type of way. In order to show both sides that you understand the points that they're making, you may want to even repeat their points to them so they know you have a clear understanding. Uh, negotiating after 
it usually involves um, maybe a follow-up on the discussion, discussing how we may handle these type of things in the future. It may be even involve uh, editing of the rules or providing, um, you know, clarification on rules or certain instances where we can actually break the rules in the future. <clears throat> so uh, in these type of negotiating processes, you may find people who want to throw the process off or um, skew things their way. They may use ridicule, they may use flattery, they may use inappropriate questioning. Um, they, you know, as it says right here, wow, that's a nice tithe. Oh, you look good today. That's just an attempt to win someone over when the, someone needs to remain unbiased and uh, objective to all the, the facts that are at hand in order to make a, uh, a clear and just decision. Uh, flattery should definitely be avoided and any, uh, any attempt of inappropriate questioning should also be pointed out and strayed away from. As far as delegating tasks, I chose one of the most common uh, delegated tasks in hospitals and nursing homes, which is checking blood glucose levels on patients. Um, in order to do the, uh, the job correctly, we need to consider the five rights. First right being the right task, second being the right circumstance, third being the right person, fourth the right direction, and also the right amount of supervision. Uh, the right task is definitely going to involve is this the right patient? And, you know, why would you check a blood sugar on a patient without diabetes or without being on steroids or any reason? So you want to make sure you're checking blood sugar on the right patient. It is a somewhat painful procedure, so you don't want to do it on the wrong person if you don't need to. Uh, the right circumstance. Is it safe to go in the patient's room? Um, you know, some patients are out of their minds and those type of things. <laughs> and you don't want to send someone in there to do something that could be considered unsafe. Uh, also, the right person. There are several people on the floor uh, that could be there. The janitor could be in there uh, cleaning the patient's room, but you definitely cannot have the janitor checking your blood sugar for you. You want to make sure you have the right staff. That can either be a nursing assistant or maybe even another nurse if they have the time to help you out. Uh, the right direction. Sometimes patients have certain restrictions that don't allow you to do a blood sugar just anywhere or a vena puncture just anywhere. They had a mastectomy on a certain side of their arm or uh, some type of neuro condition or something going on that prevents you from using that particular side. So make sure you point out these type of directions to whoever it is that's, that's assisting you. And the right supervision. Um, if you have a new staff member on board and you're un unsure if they've done a blood sugar before, you should definitely see if they need supervision or, or just go ahead and supervise them the first time that you do it and see if they do it correctly. So here you have a king who is uh, painting the road. Um, obviously he is uh, under delegating. Someone else would probably be doing that for him. I'm sure he has better things to do. Uh, this type of thing can happen in code situations when you have a nurse doing chest compressions when they should be probably passing medications. And you can have the CNA doing chest compressions. That's why everyone is getting used uh, effectively or efficiently. So uh, under delegating, over delegating, and improper delegating are all common errors. Um, improper delegation happens more often than you think. Um, in a hospital, if physical therapy, speech, or occupational therapy is trying to do something with a patient and their IV is done, you say, yeah, just disconnect it from the IV and take them where you need to take them. Um, no, the nurse has to be the one to attend to the IV. That's improper delegation. Uh, over delegation is just wearing your help thin, just you're in the room and you leave the room just because you don't want to do a task that you could have done while you were in there. Over delegating the task to other people. And there's reasons why this type of stuff may happen. Sometimes a uh, nurse may under delegate because they don't have the confidence to delegate. Um, they may over delegate because they're afraid to do a certain task so they're constantly dishing it out. Uh, these are things that help to maintain a healthy work environment. Uh, the most important in a hospital is obviously safety. And I also wanted to point out the voice. Uh, the nursing staff, they want to make sure that they're heard. They have legitimate concerns plenty of the times. And they don't want to just feel like all their actions are being dictated. They want to make sure that they have a say in the way that they can take care of their patients. Um, also, a healthy work environment, the roles and responsibilities, uh, they need to be clearly defined of what people can do and what they cannot do. This helps to prevent errors and, and also helps to promote safety. Um, 
so there's plenty of things that that promote a healthy environment. So in my current scenario, um, I do work in a what I consider to be a healthy environment. Uh, people get promoted. We're recognized for the good work that we do. We're also rewarded um, for when we, whenever we go above and beyond. Um, we do have one grievance: is that it's a critical care floor, and because there has been a low sentence, census, we haven't been um, sending our patients to other floors whenever they've been downgraded from critical status. So we'll be holding on to progressive care or even med surge level patients on our floors. Um, so this has kind of led to some dissatisfaction amongst the staff because now you have, instead of two critical patients, a nurse may have five med surge patients and they tend to not want to do that. So as you see here, leading the way, this guy's unrolling the carpet and providing a pathway for his staff, as a true leader should. Um, this is uh, how elite, you know, this is, that, that's the leadership in my eyes. So uh, in order to promote a healthy environment through leadership, positive attitude, it trickles down. Um, the attitude of the management is usually very, very contagious to the staff. Uh, you also want to promote self-care. Uh, working full-time as a nurse can be very taxing and stressing. You want to make sure your staff is, is taking care of themselves as well. And uh, you also want to do a lot of positive reinforcing. Uh, negativity can only go so far. And here are my references. I hope you've enjoyed it and I hope it was educational.